All right. Um, hey, everybody. Um, welcome back to my channel. My name is Ray. Um, I have a really good guest today. Um, Jake Tebow, is that how you say it? Yeah, like um, Tim Tebow, the football player. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, Jake is, uh, he earned a PhD from Salve Regina University in fundamental moral theology and a JD from the Southern New England School of Law. Um, Dr. Thibault also possesses a master's of business administration from Bryant University and a master's in theology from Providence College. And I think the, the first question, Jake, has got to mm -hmm. be like our, our unique like um, relationship because you, you published a book mm -hmm. not too long ago called um, Transgender Ideology and Gender Dysphoria, a Catholic Response. And you have several trans activists that, <laughs> that you um, feature as sort of like representatives of mm -hmm. like, I guess, you know, gender ideology or trans ideology. And that was me <laughs> when I <laughs> was a trans activist, you know, back when I was trans identified. Um, and, and we, and you like uh, reached out to me, I think at one point all these years ago, and we struck up a correspondence. And I remember we, had conversations about like t t t t t t teleology and like uh, and like gender <laughs> identity and sort of like these sort of big, big philosophical um, questions. Then you know, obviously, I've now detransitioned and had you know a real change in my own ideological thinking about you know this stuff. So yeah, I think this is going to be a really interesting conversation because like I'm so fascinated <laughs> by uh by this um yeah by this connection in terms of like, you writing a book in response to like things that i now also disagree with so um why don't you tell us like yeah just like how you came into this topic of like you know transgender ideology what is tran transgender ideology and how how would you discover like my my work i'm curious <laughs> yeah. well, well it's great to meet you because uh having read your book and followed you, you're a little bit like a celebrity to me, even though we were on opposite <laughs> sides at the time, I still greatly admired uh, you. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I always felt like when I was reading people's books that I was actually in relationship <laughs> with people. I don't know if that's a disorder of some kind of my own, but uh, you really get into the head of people. So uh, it's great to be here. Um, how I got into it is uh, I had, I was doing foster care. My first foster child was 17 years old, transgender, Puerto Rican, uh, six and a half feet tall, uh, uh, male to female transgender, oh, transgender, uh, uh, young transgender person. And uh, and I my, my approach was, you know, who am I to judge, right? I'm here to help and provide a safe environment and all that. So I'm not going to... I'm not challenging anyone. Plus, it seemed like it was so new at the time. Like, I don't know, totally makes sense to me, right? It, does, it didn't seem like it was a um, trend, a social phenomenon or anything like that. It just seemed like, well, some people are transgender, right? So you accept it. Um, and then I, I, with people I went to church with, um, there was a young person who uh, would probably now be understood to be autogynephilic as well, uh, male to female. And I was really close with this person. We went to Standing Rock Reservation and fought pipelines together. And uh, we, we were really good friends. And even a later foster child I had, she became the the godmother of my child, right? So it's, I didn't have any animosity or, or any uh, dislike of transgender people, but it really, interested me how things were changing right i saw in the past there was always like maybe one or two transgender people i knew and they had often been people who had some degree of mental illness i know it's awful to sound judgy but they were people who were a little bit off but you wanted to be kind and compassionate to a person that you know so i will there was always a matter of trying to be compassionate to people who have difficult life, right? It just, it seemed like the respectable thing to do is you respect people who are just trying to make it in the world. But then all of a sudden in the late 
uh, I don't know when it even was, 2015, 20 on, on onward, all of a sudden, a lot of people started coming out, just people I met. And a lot of them were just clearly young females. And all of a sudden, I'm transgender. I'm tra And I, you think, I don't feel any masculine energy coming off of you. <laughs> you feel like just a teenage girl to me. Uh, and it made me kind of question, like, well, what does this mean to be transgender? Are you saying you are a man? Because if you're saying you are a man, not just the physicalness of you, but like the energy I'm getting is not of a man. So what does it mean to be in the wrong body? And it, you know, even kind of philosophically speaking, like what does it mean to, what does it mean to be a man? And what does it mean to be a woman is a kind of phenomenological problem because I have no idea what it feels like to be anyone other than myself, right? I couldn't even say like, I feel like Ray. I don't know how you feel, <laughs> right? I could right. only have a projection of what that might like, what that might be to be somebody other than myself, right? Like it would be saying like, well, I feel like a black person or I feel like without being a black person, I don't know what it means to feel like a black person, right? How would I know they're similar? What I think a black person feels like versus what I, they actually feel like, right? You know, right? And even the problem of like, what does it feel mean to feel like anything? Like, I just know how it means to feel like me, which I don't even know what that means half the time. Um, right. So it kind of raised a question to me of like, is this a matter of being or is this a matter of desire? And what is the root cause of these issues? Because it seemed like at the time, if you were to question why someone felt the way they did, you are invalidating them, right? There's no valid right. reason to quite even question why. And you would, and I would look and say, like, well, somebody has dealt with like tons of sexual trauma, like that might be the reason why, right? It's not to invalidate them, but that might be the reason why, which seems different than why this young girl is saying that she feel like she's a man like that's a different cause right so it just seemed like there might be different causes and then reading ray blanchard with autogynephilia and androphilic it seemed to make it seems to it seemed to jive with what i knew of transgender people in my life that some people were kind of almost ultra homosexual to the point that they're almost like the other gender and other people were not like that at all there your other ones right. were like almost right. like super straight <laughs> like so straight that they like became the gender that they're most attracted to right which is totally different which again it's not to in it's i don't say that to invalidate anyone but if we don't understand what is the cause of the feelings then we can't appropriately address why they are feeling that way and like and even right. to say like i like I'm your friend means I want to understand you. <laughs> right. So, right. well, I think part of the issue is, you know, so, some of the, the transgender activists, when you look into like a cause of transgenderism, I think there's this um, fear that you're going to somehow say in virtue of it being caused by anything other than just, you know, the fact that you're born in the wrong body or that you have like a female brain sex or whatever mm -hmm. um that it's like a disorder of some way and they want it to be natural variation and so one of the common analogies is you know with like an intersex so it's like you mm -hmm. know well you know sometimes these these you know intersex or disorders of sexual development they're just part of like natural human variation mm -hmm. there's nothing like intrinsically wrong with them um so because I, I've noticed that a lot of trans activists are really allergic to anything stinking of like normativity mm -hmm. or, t or like t t t teleology. <laughs> so, like, um, so I was I was wondering if you wanted to talk about what is not like nominalism and its relationship to like gender theory and some of these like underlying issues. Because I found that to be like a really fascinating um, part of your book was this emphasis on like 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 that like diagnosis of like what's going wrong with gender theory is that it's like nominalist. So I wonder if you could like explain what that is and like how it ties into some of these, you know, things that the gender activists are, are saying. Um, yeah. Yeah. This type of nominalism is, you know, it's this idea that we don't, that 
these labels don't actually mean anything. They're just whatever you want them to mean, right? So this is kind of goes back to the Matt Walsh, like, what is a woman asking people? Well, a woman is what, somebody who identifies as a woman. Well, that's a very nominalist response, right? It's like anyone who says that they are a member of this category, then they're a member of the category. What does the category mean? It means whatever you want it to mean, <laughs> right? Right. But, uh, uh, it's not really very uh, illuminative in in many ways because it doesn't, right? If if all a woman means is a person who identifies as one, it's not right. really very. It doesn't tell us anything really. In something like man or woman or race, right? Or nationality. They 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 mean something, right? It does mean something, right? Um, right. Well, a lot of people will say in, in response to that, they'll be like, "Well, you know, the English language is sort of like inherently circular. If like if you sort of you know trace through the dictionary all these you know definitions, you'll eventually go in a circle at some you know zoomed out level." So, what's like your response to like this claim or th this idea that like, well, you know, circularity is like not that big of a deal because we see it in like other aspects of you know language. Like the classic mm -hmm. example is like sometimes it's like really hard to give like clear definitions of like what a chair is. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems like we just get stuck in this like these this this meta layer of disagreement where we're just disagreeing about what to call things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It seems like, uh, it's, 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 but it's really hard. Like, like un, 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 unless you think it's important to get beyond that, just mm -hmm. like descriptivist um, label, it's like, it's hard to have any substantive conversation because I feel like people, mm -hmm. people just like talk past each other in this conversation. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do this all the time with my students. Like, what is red? <laughs> like nobody can define what red is, you know, until you had maybe a spectroscope or something like you really couldn't define what red was. But it does seem like things like maybe gender is a kind of, kind of harder thing to describe gender. But sex is a real thing, even without language. Sex is yeah. real. Right. Um, and it's binary. And what do you mean by sex? Because I know a lot of people will say like, oh, well, what, what is that? That That's like, you know, Jew, I mean, if you talk to Judith Butler, then like that, yeah, that sex, is also yeah. socially constructed and mediated yeah. by these like cultural practices like sex assignment and like legal registries and, you know, <laughs> like. All yeah, yeah. Like, so. Well, um, well, sex, you know, a, a one who produces large gametes. <laughs> is a female and one who produced small gametes is a male. Uh, Aristotle says one who procreates within one's body is a female and one who procreates outside of one's body is a male. You could also then say, well, some people are sterile and they can't have children, which is true, but they're still right. kind of, of the kind, right? Of the nature right. of which they produce that. But there is also like, so there's, some people just say the chromosomes, but it's not just the chromosomes. The chromosomes also leads to the hormones, which also leads right, to right. the way you reproduce, which leads to a morphology, which and this is very important when, the, when you're forming in the, the womb, the testosterone or the estrogen within the womb has a lot in the formation of the brain, right? Which also changes the way that people can understand the world. And there's some wonderful evolutionary biologists who, who, who I think are, make the claim like what has more to do with the way that we see the world in terms of gender um that we were given a pink t-shirt when we were a kid growing up or like 130 million years of evolution and it's probably the 130 right. million years of evolution um yeah there does there does seem to be like speaking of evolution i think i'm, I'm kind of curious because i think this is interesting from like like a catholic perspective because typically you know i think mm -hmm. at least in the more like evangelical protestant world mm -hmm. of religion in america people don't really think of like you know christianity or religion and then think of like you know evolutionary psychology mm -hmm. or something like this uh -huh. but you know if natural selection applied to the body of animals mm -hmm. um, 
you know, the brain is part of the body. So, you know, it would be really surprising if like natural selection had no impact on like the brain and therefore like behavior, you know, we see deer who are, you know, are born with like the firmware to like be able to walk mm -hmm. the first day. So it's like, so, so clearly like nature is capable of like baking in these things. So in regards to like um, these innate sex differences, um, like, it, do, it does seem like a lot of the transgender activists are just like really allergic to acknowledging any validity to, you know, fields like evolutionary psychology or just like don't mm -hmm. see evolution as like relevant to talking about mm -hmm. things like the patriarchy or gender differences or these innate sex differences. And just kind of, it just becomes like this fuzzy, like, you know, once, <laughs> you know, like modern society comes around that that's like, where they begin their analysis it seems like um yeah yeah i i think that's and i know within these conversations we always go back to john money but i think they're not to go into the whole john money story but part of john money's argument but going back to the late 70s which went all the way up to 2000 right not that long ago was that sex or gender is entirely a social convention that men and women are completely identical other than their socialization. And that's been found to be dead wrong, <laughs> right? That's just clearly not, not the case. And they've tried to make gender neutral toys and the boys use the, 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 the dollhouses to catapult things off the top. <laughs> and right. they've tried to make like, it, it's just, there is a difference between male and female psychology now our dichotomy is not that brit it's not huge right the difference between a, a, a man and a woman isn't like right. just really different but it is a little bit different right in terms of the evolutionary biology like a lot of the stuff you know some of this is speculative but if you're going to be a hunter you are going to have to be sitting still quietly waiting in a bush we know now that like male brains can almost shut down to very low uh, um, functioning, which is why they like things like fishing or sports. The brain is almost entirely off, which is perfectly fine. Whereas a female brain never shuts down. It is always active, which is why fishing would be like brain numbingly boring for the typical female brain uh, or watching sports might be numb brain numbing because it's like, they're thinking 15 different things, whereas the male's brain is like shut down to a low level. But women had to be living in community, taking care of the children, usually doing local farming, taking care of daily activities. They needed to be like on top of it versus a hunter, which had to be like sitting silent for a long period of time, right? So just certain things have kind of come out of our evolutionary biology the fear, though, that feminists often have, I think, is as soon as you say there's a difference between a male brain and a female brain, it means females are meant to be like in the kitchen making sandwiches and, <laughs> and they can't have right. a job and their only job is to take care of kids. But right. it doesn't mean that. Right? It doesn't necessarily mean that. Right. I mean, insofar as like, you know, innate cognitive differences track to different sort of like stereotyped cultural patterns like you know maybe the more you know on average you know male type brain has like a higher predisposition towards being interested in things and then you know mm -hmm. vice versa for being interested in people if you have the you know the, on average like the like the female type mm -hmm. of brain but people take that and they read it into like a prescription of like oh well if mm -hmm. you are female then you ought not to um you know, pursue these mathematical or technical trainings because, but, you know, so I think, I think people just have a hard time thinking in like terms of averages because like, yeah, yeah. you know, cause it's like on average, you know, yes, like there might be these differences, even if there, there are females who have, you know, masculine, um, you know, type co cognitive styles. So like, for example, my wife is like very much like, you know, she has like a degree in mathematics Mm -hmm. She can like whenever I need to do like mental math for like tipping in the <laughs> restaurant, I, I always ask her because her like, you know, mathematical, um, you know, abilities just mm -hmm. um, so she has kind of that like technical analytical mind that like I mm -hmm. don't have. 
Um, but you know, I, I, I would say that's not like, you know, the typical pattern, mm -hmm. even though it also doesn't mean that she has like a male brain. Cause I think mm -hmm. people think in terms of like, yeah, trans people have female brains in a male body, uh -huh. like right, vice versa. So I was, and, and you have like a lot of, in, in your book on like the, the, the neuroscience of like transgenders. So I wonder if you can like talk about you know, the, the concept of like, like, what is it like, what is like a male or female brain or like, like, why is that like a helpful concept or not a helpful concept? Or how would you think about some of these neuroscientific um, claims from people in the gender ideology claiming that like, uh, well, if you look at the neuroscience, it like proves, you know, the validity of, you know, that we have these like mismatched identities relative to like our bodies or something. Yeah, yeah. I spend a lot of a, a chapter or two on that in my book. And it's because the claims are often so um, ideologically driven. So there was there was an article that came out. Uh, it's since has been withdrawn from the Harvard website, but it was making the claim that medical science has proven that there are people who have the opposite brain. Right. This is this is a fact that look at here's five studies that have shown that, you know, men, transgender women have uh, female brains. And then on the other side, there's people who say there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever to suggest that, that anybody could have an opposite gendered brain, opposite sex brain. And when I looked at it, at the time I wrote my book, I read every study that there was, which honestly was not that many. Um, but I, I read out through all of them. And there's some convincing evidence that suggests it's possible, right? That, that there are some elements of the brain which seem to be like the opposite sex. However, if you consider that there are thousands of pieces of the brain, right? And not all of them are gendered, right? Some of them are like heartbeat, right? It doesn't, there's no gendered heartbeat, male, or female heartbeat, right? Most of it's not gendered at all, right? But if you look at particular areas, like, Connections between uh, the left and right hemispheres of the brains are different versus men and women, gray matter versus uh, white matter. Um, the hypothalamus is, is a very sexualized part of the brain more than others. Um, if you go down to like just to the hypothalamus and just to certain areas and just to this area, you could find that some transgender people have a higher amount of the opposite brain structure than uh, they're not right. And some people who had hormones and stuff, and you could say that could change the brain, but some people had not received hormones, but here's the challenge of these studies. It's like, okay, there's thousands of parts of the brain. You've looked at this one very specific area and you have a pool of people of 40 people, 30 people, right? So you're looking at 30 or 40 people as a pool and you're taking thousands of parts of the brain. You're reducing it to one part of the brain so it's evidence that it's possible that some transgender people might have some opposite brain structures possible, right? But that is not conclusive evidence, right? That's not, <laughs> it's, it's not conclusive, but it suggests, it suggests something. There's not a lot of studies on it recently. And I think it's because it's such a polarized topic. One, if you, if you come out and say that male and female that a transgender person does not have the brain structures like what they've claimed. You're going to get silenced for that. The other part of it is, the other argument is, you don't need to have a biological structure. It's just whatever you identify as, right? You don't right. need the, the medical evidence. So like you have two different, like there's just no good reason to do the studies if you're a scientist because everyone will be against you. Right. And from what I've seen, um, it, it seems like most of these studies, they don't um, properly control for sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when you do some of these, you know, um, se sexual dimorphisms in these different you know areas of the brain, they, they seem to be mm -hmm. tracking the sexual orientation more so than, you know, the gender identity of mm -hmm. like women. Because I think that's, you know, one of the, and I want to get into like the Blanchardian typology stuff, because mm -hmm. I think it's, that's one of the things that just, Th 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 throws a wrench and the typical, you know, um, trans narrative about, you mm -hmm. know, how these gender dysphoric feelings arise, which is that, well, they say, you know, this is all caused by 
a sort of belief that one ought to have been born in like mm -hmm. a sex body or something like this. But, you know, if that was the case, if it was caused by the identity in some way or another, even though the identity is just this like subjective feeling and the subjective feeling is the same across both like the, um, the androphilic um, transsexuals versus like mm -hmm. the, you know, the bisexual or like the gynophilic transsexuals, mm -hmm. like, you know, they both have the same identity, but mm -hmm. you see these incredibly different presentations. So it seems like mm -hmm. there, there must be a different factor at play in causing these two two different types to emerge but for some reason like that basic point is like it's always just like glossed over i think because mm -hmm. i think they just don't want to like acknowledge that like that is the case but i've never seen like a convincing response um so i'm curious like in the research in your book what did you like learn about like um land charting and topology was there anything that was like surprising to you that you didn't you know already know about like in in your research looking into this um well be what, what what shocks me with the the, the blanchard uh stuff is just how many transgender people who identify as transgender have never heard of it before <laughs> but that part is always shocking to me be like you've trained you've identified that you are actually transgender but you haven't looked at any of the yeah, it, it does seem like they like most people i think have heard of it they just all dismiss it as you know there's this common narrative it's like practically like a like a meme at this point it's mm -hmm. so prevalent because it just gets like repeated as like a dogma this idea that um you know it's pseudoscientific it's unfalsifiable mm -hmm. It's transphobic. You know, Ray Blanchard mm -hmm. was a transphobe. He was like, mm -hmm. you know, an abuser. They, you know, really like, you know, slander his, you know, character, um, and and trying to like, like impugn, like impugn the character of these sexologists. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It it, it is fascinating because you know, according to the research I've seen, like um, eighty percent, um, or more of you know. The trans feminine um, people are of the autogynophilic ideology, which is mm -hmm. you know, which is like the vast majority, and yet it's it's like you can't talk about it. Um, right, right. Well, because if you can identify this as some type of extreme form of transsexualism, now you've turned it into a like a fetish, which they don't want it as a fetish. It has to be an identity, right? Which identity is seems. Like I don't know, pure, right. pure thing, right? Well, Versus like fetish, which is a sexual. Right. Thing. The way I, I was thinking about this the other day was that you know I think I think people are are are, are confused and have this like straw man conception of what the Blanchardian typology suggests. Like all it suggests mm -hmm. is that these different factors are there as like a predisposing factor. Mm -hmm. um, so autogynophilia mm -hmm. is just this like internalized attraction to oneself that just exists as a predisposing factor but in terms of like what causes you to you know how you react to that predisposing factor in your own mm -hmm. life whether you you know repress it or manage it or integrate it or or go you know full-blown transition and and mm -hmm. in response to that often that's you know influenced by like probably all these other factors so when these trans women are like reflecting on their own life in terms of like why did i do that like why did i like up in my life Mm -hmm. like the story that their mind tells them is not like, oh, I did that only because of this. It just doesn't feel like that. Um, but I don't think the theory ever like really said that there can't be these more extra factors that are specific to the individual person's unique life history. Cause everyone's life history is like mm -hmm. very complicated. And we all have, you know, when people talk about psychological theories, I think people like, um, they they mistake like what is the purpose of a psychological theory which is not to be like reductionistic about you know at the individual life level but more like making like population group level distinctions between you know the transsexuals who are exclusively attracted to men who at the group level show these distinct patterns versus like this mm -hmm. other group of people who you know show this different pattern at like the group level and you can only really think about it at the group level but people look at their individual lives and think like oh my my decision feels way more complicated than that so therefore you know mm -hmm. this theory can't possibly be true because you know transsexualism is more complicated or, or my identity is like 
more like complicated. So um, it just seems like people have like a mistaken idea of like what the theory entails, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I think people also think that Ray Blanchett is invalidating people by making these distinctions too, where he's Ray is Ray Blanchett. He's not from what, what I gather from him. He's not ideologically driven by any of this. He's not saying it's good or bad. He's not making yeah. a moral component of it. He's not saying, you know, you need to change the legislation or we need, he's just simply pointing out like, this is kind of how people kind of fit into these categories and they're, they're thinking this way, perhaps, you know, kind of got categorically for different types of reasons. And I, and he based this off of his work looking at case files. He just read through like tons and tons of case files and he was trying to come up with common themes, right? Common themes from the reality that he was observing, which again, I think is very useful of like, look at real life scenarios and kind of don't come up with the theory, right? That's John Money. Like I have the theory, men and women are the same, right? So now I'm going to look for the evidence that backs up my theory, right? Versus Ray Blanchard's approach was like, let me look at all the cases and let me find similarities and connections. And then he comes up with these theories like this is very Aristotelian, which is why I like it. Right. right. It's very right. Aristotelian because it's based on observation um, again. But part of it isn't telling people what they have to do. It's just saying, isn't this interesting? Right. 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 It might deal with it might deal with then go to like, what's the appropriate therapies? But the therapy should be based on reality, not based on ideology, right? So now it's up to the right. therapist to determine what to do with this, right? Right. So on the flip side, though, even though, you know, Blanchard took this very, like, you know, neutral, you know, just like descriptive empirical approach, a lot of people, you know, in, in response to autogonophilia, given that this is like seemingly, according to the research, you know, the majority of, you know, trans-identified males are of this autogonophilic type, mm -hmm. and because it has these connections to, you know, uh, paraphilic sexual orientation. People just sort of um, have all these, you know, ethical issues with this, mm -hmm. you know, insofar as, you know, um, you know, so there is this push to introduce social normativity and saying like, you know, we do need to stigmatize this. We actually shouldn't destigmatize it, you know, and, you know, I, I my thinking is like people who are more, conservative in their ideology, um, you know, particularly of seemingly of like religious background, they're more likely to say like, well, you know, we need to have like a normative element of like stigmatization such that you can use shame to like socially regulate this because, you know, shame um, ser serves an important, you know, regulative function in society mm -hmm. to prevent, you know, these sorts of sexual deviancies from, um, you know, and so that that's a common argument I hear on the conservative side. Whereas I think the more uh, you're more liberal, libertarian types are going to be more like, well, you know, as long as you're not harming anyone, you know, you can. Th th this like does it hurt anyone? So 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 if you want to like, you know, transition and like you know live as a woman, even though you're ultimately this has its like roots in this like sexual orientation or paraphilia or how, however you want to characterize it um so i'm curious from like a catholic perspective like where does like normativity um you know does like the bible you know say like thou shalt not like identify as a as the opposite <laughs> sex and, and try and like deceive people about your natal sex by passing and living this other life or i'm just kind of curious like what is like or like you know if it's like for you know autogynophilic purposes versus like other you know reasons or uh, yeah yeah you know it's hard. there's no transgender in the bible no matter how hard anyone looks you're not going to find it right there there are references right in leviticus and things like that thomas aquinas as well you know you shouldn't be you should live into the truth is thomas aquinas's main point right we should live in the truth um Here's a, a conservative uh, concern, which it should just be a social concern, right? Let's say autogynophilics, most of them until more recently, most people who came out as autogynophilic were typically much older in life. They often had been police officers, military, truck drivers, very masculine fields. They went hunting, 
there was no indication of that this person was computer programmers computer like. program, right these are not fe- these are not people who people thought oh that's a girl right they are usually like a man's man type of person which also meant they often married they have children they have grandchildren so if if you're 50 years old and your view is you know, maybe you've been even playing around with uh, cross-dressing and stuff like that for periods of your married life. And now you you see on the TV all this stuff about transgender is celebrated. Isn't this wonderful? This is your true self. You have to be your true self. And now you say, actually, that's me. That's That's who I am. Well, what is the cost of doing this? Well, one of the costs is probably will destroy a marriage because only like 7% of marriages survive when a, a when a person trans trans is like this because the wife was not married to a woman the wife was married to a man and this you've made this very complicated um and you have a commitment to that covenant you made to your wife to be there for good times and bad so if if part of this is well my I want to live out my sexual expression That should not be higher than the covenant you've made with your wife, who's the mother of your children, right? Your your commitment to your family should come before your own desires, right? That's that's that is an ethical issue there because it's not like I think coming out as gay, where even that might be might be ultra conservative to say you should be married to your wife even if you're gay, but. there is something different, right? There is something different between being gay and transgender, uh, or especially autogynephilic. Um, again, relationships to your family, really, you know, these are complicated. The other part is if you're coming out at 50 years old, unless you are Bruce Jenner, you're probably not going to be able to afford the types of surgeries that will make you convincingly a woman. At 50 something years old, you're not going to be, nobody's going to mistake you for a woman ever you've been fully masculinized. So if the whole idea is like, I really want to embody that feminine, like you're not going to, right? It's not going to actually be a reality. And one of my advisors from my doctorate, he was a Dominican priest who also a biologist from MIT, MIT biologist and a Catholic priest, the Dominican priest. He got approached in a parking lot one time by a guy who who identified as transgender. And he was a, a man married to a woman, autogynephilic. Um, and the priest met with him and he re- realized, like, well, what is the least invasive thing you could do in order to feel most like yourself, right? You could go all the way to surgery and everything like that. It's going to ruin your marriage. Um, you're never going to look like a woman at your age, you're never going to look like a woman. You're poor, especially, right? You're never going to look like a woman. You can't afford any of these surgeries. And you live in a poor area where people are not sophisticated. They will probably attack you for the way you look walking down the street in this neighborhood. So what do you need to do to feel survivable, right? And it it turns into, well, if I just put on panties, that's enough of the feminine that they can survive. It's like, so if if putting on panties or going to a, a autogynephilic retreat once a year for a weekend where you dress as a woman once, you know, one weekend a year, if that's enough to get you by, but it maintains your marriage, you're no longer a target on the street, you no longer have to be an outcast everywhere you go. Like, maybe that's the better approach, would be the least invasive method versus like our kind of narrative now. It's like, no, you must go all the way because that's how you embrace who you really are. And like, this should be celebrated. It's like, there are reality checks, right? <laughs> there is, right. not everyone is super rich who can afford every surgery and not, and even if you did, you're still not going to look at like you think you're going to look. And there's going to be like other medical repercussions that come with this, higher heart disease, higher cancer rates, right? There's other issues right. that come with transitioning. So let's not just paint like, rainbows on one side and otherwise you're going to kill yourself on the other side there maybe there's something in between um which i think is a good healthier catholic response would be looking at the individual and saying let's not be ideologically driven what is best for this person right given their life and their situation and it's not necessary 
is usually not the case of a medicalized approach, probably. Right. So in terms of like, um, you know, looking at, you know, this question of transition and like what, what's the right therapeutic intervention at the individualistic level, what is your thoughts from your research on like the pediatric gender medicine question? Because there, you know, I know in the recent cast review, Dr. Cast talked mm -hmm. a lot about the importance of having like an individualized care plan that's like holistic and like tailored to like the individual like needs of like a person's like life, you know, to address like all their mental health comorbidities and like specific social challenges in, in, in life. Um, but, you know, there are some people due to, for example, ethical concerns about informed consent and whether it's even like theoretically possible for a minor to give consent to these sorts of things that, you know, might have an impact on their future, you know, ability to have children or something like this. So I'm curious, like, whether you think that at the pediatric level, you know, there should be kind of just like a more like outright restriction um, or, you know, do you think it's like a case by case thing or kind of what's like your position on that from, from your research? Um, Cause I know that's like a huge topic right now. A lot of like yeah. the gender critical, um, you know, world is focused on the pediatric transition. And I, like, like a lot of people are just like, leave the kids alone, mm -hmm. you know, stay out of sports and like everything else, just do what you want. You're an adult, but like, you know, keep the kids out of it. So there seems to be like this emphasis on like the kids. I'm kind of curious, like whether you still hold that, like in that case by case approach with like children, or you have like a more like blanket um, restriction. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It seems like, you know, the question is why the kids, like, why, why is all this emphasis on the kids? And, you know, I guess it, I've heard it said like part of it could be if there are trans adults, it means there must be trans, there must've been trans children at some point. So the fact that there's trans children kind of validates the transgender adults, right? Which in that way that the kids maybe are used as a tool. Maybe that's part of it. I'm not entirely sure. I think Abigail Schreier's more recent book uh, and then Jonathan Haidt's book on the most anxious generation ties in a lot to this stuff. You know, I, I think it's the, the use of the internet and the use of uh, social media is really detrimental to young people, particularly young females who are looking for socialization in a way that young guys not, aren't even looking for socialization. Um, it seems that seems to make sense to me. I've talked with Lisa Littman, uh, before, uh, you know, with rapid onset gender dysphoria, I think it's gotta be an unquestionable, uh, phenomenon. I, I, you know, you can doubt that, that this is true, but right. you can't Why do you like, think there's such uh, a, a resistance to the, the rapid onset um, claim like the idea that there's any sort of like cultural or environmental influence. I mean, it just seems weird because like, you know, typically, you know, pe people on like the, you know, that sort of progressive, you know, woke worldview lean into these sorts of like social learning, social constructivist mm -hmm. theories in regards to human nature where like everything is learned. So it's like, like, why is it, you know, like they're not like, yeah, you, you learn, you socially construct your own trans identity through exposure to these complex, you know, signs and systems and cultural signifiers, just like they do in the rest of like gender theory. But somehow mm -hmm. with like, this, they like resort to these very like essentialist, you know, born this way, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like, um, which, which also, you know, they, they can't really make that square with like detransitioners because, you know, if these gender identities are like biological and innate, um, then like it doesn't explain how identity can change um, with de with detransitioners who experience mm -hmm. like like a shift in their gender identity, which, you know, yeah. so these things can't be innate because they're they, you know, the case of the detransitioners proves that they're mutable to some degree or another. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, part of the research is I read everybody I could on the topic comes from conservative to the most liberal. And like, it's interesting the claim because it's like detransitioners don't exist because detransitioners were never trans to begin with. 
but then it's like all trans people know that they're trans so we should go full-on approach for all trans people but then it's like but kids don't know what they are right like that's part of like the, that's the whole point of like yeah an eight-year-old who turns out not to be transgender even though they identify as transgender at eight like was never transgender to begin with. Like, that's the problem is like, we don't have a way to diagnose people to know whose gender dysphoria will persist, right? Who's, some children probably are gender dysphoric. It will be gender dysphoric for their entire life and whether or not they should be med medicalized, that's a question, right? It's certainly not 30% of a middle school. <laughs> right, so... Yeah. I'll, like I, I've heard a lot of the trans activists will say things like, "Well, that like eighty percent, that eighty percent desistance mm -hmm. statistic that you often hear from people critical of pediatric gender medicine, they'll say like, well, that research is misleading because actually, you know, that is conflating merely gender nonconforming children versus these children with like these really persistent mm -hmm. identity claims." Yeah. Um, so. But I recently went back to one of the original Zucker papers mm -hmm. and looked at, you know, his research on that, you know, came out of that or that was generated this 80% statistic of desistance. Mm -hmm. And these, you know, quote unquote, merely gender non-conforming children were making like identity claims in regards mm -hmm. to cross-sex identification. So it wasn't just mere like, you know, um, you know, homosexual uh, nonconformity, it was like, you know, they actually had like gender identity confusion of some type mm -hmm. or another. And, and, that, and that was still consistent with the statistic of them going on to desist. So I don't really know where the activists are getting this claim that that somehow that research is not valid and that, you mm -hmm. know, really dig into it. We, we can clearly, you know, tell who, who are the trans kids versus like who are the... right gender non-conforming um, homosexual young boys and girls, which I don't feel like we can make that distinction, but they think we can, mm -hmm. but it seems like critical to like the success of this like project to make that diagnostic distinction. Well, we've been studying this for what, 12 years now? <laughs> like this is, we don't have long-term, but like even the, the Zucker uh, in the Steensma type of numbers of 80 for something percent, like, if you look at the like the, the pool of people, like they've con they've got that by like compiling like three different studies together to make a total of like one hundred subjects, right? Like like this whole eighty percent is based off of like a hundred subjects, and this is all from like before like twenty thirteen or something like that, right? Which that was before all of this like explosion of youth being ident you know being diagnosed as gender dysphoric, right? Like so this number eighty percent is probably like was probably fairly true then but like we're probably talking much higher numbers than that now right and this was even that 80 percent right. number was only like desisting by the age of 15. well how about desisting by the age of 25 right like like 15 right. 15 still young you know it's still pretty young like and at that time that those studies were done there were practically zero teenagers who are identifying as transgender it was very young kids who kind of themed off to their parents right and they they brought him in and then there were adults but there were very few teenagers who identified as transgender when these studies were even done right so it, i think the number is going to be much higher than that right. the only thing that might keep people in it though is like you've put so much energy into making this your identity how do you get out of it right how do you how do you say like yeah, I kind of made a mistake. <laughs> made a mistake, mom and dad. Yeah. Like, how do you do that? Yeah, it does seem like um, I I've kind of had this thought kick around for a while now, where like, insofar as a lot of gender dysphoric people talk about, like, you know, prior to you know encountering, you know, another transsexual person um, mm -hmm. in like the media or on TV or in a movie or something or on the internet, they didn't really have like words to put. Um, their, their feelings into mm -hmm. um, so like the exposure to the transsexual narrative identity became like a possibility model to provide like a like a container like a schema mm -hmm. or a narrative or a container to like make sense of like their feelings and I think likewise detransition 
is increasingly becoming like a new like narrative container for people to understand mm -hmm. um, their experiences. Um, and I think, you know, as more of these detransitioner narratives become popularized, um, you know, that's going to provide like another possibility model for, for example, like a young, you know, butch female to understand their experiences through this like lens of like, oh, wow, like actually my whole entire experience, you know, can be made sense through this framework of being like a butch mm -hmm. lesbian. Um, and so, so yeah, I, I think like as these new narratives are, are you know, being talked about more, I think it's going to kind of have like a kind of reverse effect and so in, in mm -hmm. terms of like having more possibility models for people to contextualize these feelings mm -hmm. and like not feel like this one particular identity and pathway is like an mm -hmm. inevitable like thing because i think that's kind of like the, been the narrative for so long is like like if you have these feelings this is how you have to identify these are the steps you have to take mm -hmm. this is you know the way you know the therapeutic intervention has to look like and if you don't uh you know 100 affirm that particular pathway you're like a transphobe or whatever mm -hmm. yeah yeah it is interesting right and, and i think you're, you're approaching like the the topic of like gender norms within society like as a catholic right pope francis and uh a lot of this hadn't really hit the stage until pope francis but like he spent spends a lot of time when he's talking about this issue to say like we just can't view society so rigidly through gender stereotypes. Like if you like Barbie dolls, then you must be a woman. And if you like GI Joe, you must be a man. And if you like to climb trees, you must be a man. And if you like to bake, you must be a woman, right? These rigid, like, and sometimes the conservatives in response are going to be like, well, we're going to teach men to be men. So we're going to go hunting. Right. And we're going to teach women to be women. So we're going to do like knitting with only the women or something like that. Right. But these things in some ways might make it worse because it's saying like, right. this is the well, only way to be a man, only way to be a woman. A, 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 a lot of people, you know, might respond to like, you know, the Catholic, you know, to what you just said in terms of, yeah, like as like, you know, the Catholic response, we want to, you know, eliminate these gender stereotypes, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, if you're a boy, you can't, you know, act in these different ways. But you know, at the same time, lo a lot of people hear the church leadership talking, you know, in terms of reinforcing gender stereotypes, you know, driven mm -hmm. from scriptural you mm -hmm. know, precedent, like, you know, some of Paul's letters saying, you know, women ought to be subservient mm -hmm. to men on like spiritual matters, men are the head of the household, mm -hmm. um, you know, like uh, the, the, the Catholic church position on like, you know, women becoming priests. Mm -hmm. so, it's, so there does seem to be like, on the one hand, like a, a like upholding these, essentialized differences mm -hmm. and sort of stereotyped behaviors, you know, like teaching and authority in like a, you know, spiritual setting. Like, mm -hmm. um, so I guess what would be your, your response there in terms of saying like, well, the Catholic church is, is itself like propping up, like, you know, these gender stereotypes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, for most of ours, like they're, they're rooted in the maleness and femaleness, not in the man and woman in some sense. Right? It's based off of the it's based off of one's role as a co-creator in the world, right? That husband, wife, um, God coming together and then you produce children. So like even a woman who doesn't have any children is in some sense feminine. Right. But not in, but when we use that term in the Catholic Church, we don't mean gender stereotypes. Feminine is based out of one's motherliness, or, and one's masculinity is based out of one's fatherliness. Right. So, like, even when I'm teaching my students in the classroom, I am father, I'm presenting fatherliness to them in a way, right? And in some ways, this is very undefined, because what does fatherliness teaching look differently than motherliness teaching, right? If you take out the gender stereotypes, but it is a bit of that kind of mystery of like, father, like my 
like that I saw on British television, there was somebody who's like, there was a, a single mother and she's like, I'm actually the father of my children too, because I'm a single mother. So I'm like, so I'm the father of the, and it's like, no, you're still just the mother, right? You're still the mother right. in a sense, because that's what you are, right? And a mother who takes their kids hunting is doing it in a motherly way, but it's rooted out of that role of procreation, which might seem really strange to the modern world, but it's really strongly linked to that relationship. So even like, for example, priests being male, it's because men procreate in another, that they are the giver of life in, in, in the sperm, right? They, they are the giver of it and the woman is the receiver. So like the priesthood is a giver is the priest takes on the person of Christ and is the, the giver of the gifts. Um, and the church is the recep recipient of the gifts and the woman is, is the image of the, the church, right? They receive the gifts. So even the priesthood, even though they're celibate, they still are tied into that functional role of impregnating. <laughs> strangely enough right right yeah but yeah i know i know there's like, like a lot of feminists will probably have like you know a problem with that theology but yeah you know, but it doesn't um, have but... anything at all to do with gender stereotypes it has nothing to do with like well men are more courageous and they're more like these they have these virtues like we don't have that at all right even down to edith stein uh, saying edith stein uh, who's a wonderful philosopher who was killed by the nazis um she says like men have courage women have courage they might be different the way that they have courage but they are both courageous right men are smart and women are smart they might be smart in different ways but and they don't define what those right. ways are there might be different ways in which males are different than females but they all have the same virtues and the same capacities but in their own particular way right and it's better right. probably not to pigeonhole what that means too much just because we don't all fit into those categories right right um so one of the things i wanted to ask you about was at the beginning of, of your book you start talking about um this other book uh, i think it's called um when harry became sally and you talked about yeah. how it was like banned on like amazon uh -huh. um you know and like amazon has this policy of like um you know, you, 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 you can't say that, you know, transgender people have like a mental illness. And like, I noticed that you in your books, but like you went <laughs> out of, you went out of your way to say that being trans is not a mental illness. And you kind of mm -hmm. thought it's better characterized as like a neurodevelopmental condition. But to me, that seems like a almost like semantics, um, you know, like, is, is it like, you know, a mental illness, neurodevelopmental? I mean, all mental illnesses are based on the brain. So mm -hmm. you, you could like recharacterize mental illness as like a neurodevelopmental because everything is neurodevelopmental because mm -hmm. everything is based right. on the neurons and all neurons all develop. So it's like, so I don't know. I don't really see like, what is like the distinction that you're trying to get at there in terms of saying like, you know, um, you know, gender dysphoria is, is like, or being trans is, is not like a mental disorder in some way, because it seems like, you know, being born with a desire to, you know, invert your penis and like you mm -hmm. are absolutely psychologically tortured and miserable and hate yourself until you can make that happen. To me, that seems like, you know, in the realm of like dysmorphia, just like, mm -hmm looking at your body as an anorexic and thinking that you really need that there's something wrong with it and you need to like starve yourself for essentially and, mm -hmm. and it's only if you change modify your body so to me like like why are why are you like not willing to say that i'm um, being trans is like some way like a mentally ill yeah well i think it's because well partially because I think there are different reasons why people identify as transgender for one, uh, right? The way I proposed you in the, my book, <laughs> uh, and maybe, you know, maybe you could, now I know you, you identify as autogynephilic. I would have said that you were more of an ideological transgender person, just being transgressive. Like it seemed like the push was to overthrow the patriarchy, overthrow gender normativity, 
to kind of disrupt the gender binary, right? Like, and I think there's a lot of people who kind of fit into the category of like, it's an act of political and social rebellion, in which case, like, they are neither neurodevelopmental or mentally ill. They are, they are basing it off of a philosophy, right? Like, this would be no different than like, I don't know, Sartre or Foucault or, right? Like, right. there's people who have ideas, right? They're ideas, and there's nothing wrong with having ideas, but um, I think there are people who are, it is really debilitating, in which case, like, it, like, it probably should, right? It is a, it right. is a mental I, I know. Illness. There's people when, between, like, too. Yeah, when a lot of people hear about, you know, the Blanchardian distinction between, you know, like, the like, autogynophilic type, there's sort of like mm -hmm. this, knee-jerk reaction to say like well you know if you have autogynophilia and that was like the reason why you transitioned well then th that means like you were never really trans you didn't have real gender dysphoria mm -hmm. and somehow like that's different than like the this quote-unquote like true transsexual there is sort of mm -hmm. this concept of, like you know being true trans or mm -hmm. uh, like having gender dysphoria that is to some extent like a like a medical condition of some kind or or another that's often how it's characterized in terms of like you have this like medical mismatch like you know mm -hmm. like a brain brain intersex mismatch of some type mm -hmm. and it's like has like a diagnosable thing it's like treated like a physical disease uh, people might say it's like oh i have like a like a, like a, I don't have like a mental illness. I have like an endocrine problem that needs like fixing mm -hmm. or something. Like this. So, right, like, right. Um, but but to me, like I, I don't I don't think it's possible to like carve that like clean distinction because I think e even even in the case of the autogynophile, you know, it can lead to severe anatomical body dysmorphia, often more extreme than the homosexual type who's often for them, it's more like a social integration into how do I socially integrate in, integrate into society as like a feminine male who's like attracted to men and wants to date, you know, straight mm -hmm. men. So I'm attracted to straight men. So it seems like that's more of like a social integration question. And then like the body stuff is a way to facilitate that social integration. Whereas like for a lot of the organophiles, like the primary um, neurosis is on that, like, um, it's like a deep dislike of like the masculinity. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that, so that respects, like, you know, you might consider the autogynophilic type to be just as much of like a, you know, like a dysphoric mental, you know, condition than, um, you know, it, 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 any other type. And also the autogynophilic types, are often the most ideological types that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like overthrow the patriarchy, smash the cis het normativity, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but like, I think they're doing that to rationalize the autogynophilia because, you know, saying that you're transgender because you want to smash the patriarchy is better than saying you're transgender because when you're 13 years old, you got a, euphor a, a euphoria boner by, you know, trying on your sister's clothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, Right, right. Yeah. I think more of the radical, the more radical transgressives are, are often the homosexual types, I think. Oh, really? Like, Interesting. I tend to think so, right? Because like, maybe it's just against stereotype, but like, a lot of the people who traditionally have been autogynophilic have come out much later in life. They're more typically masculine. They're more typically guys, guys type of thing. I don't think that like the typical like 50 year old ex-military father of five like guys guy who goes hunting on the weekend just thinking of overturning the patriarchy <laughs> like yeah, a lot but of I, but I also think you know, like like that is like to some extent like a stereotype, stereotype of the yeah. world, because i think like in today's internet culture i mean i think like if you go back 30 years ago mm -hmm. the only people who of the autogynophilic type who had us intense enough uh, autogynophilia that would like drive them to full blown transition, you know, that like process of like in, of individuation and coming to that like identity crisis, you know, that, that took a long time for that identity crisis to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, but nowadays I think with like, you know, there's more, way more awareness. Mm -hmm. um, there's also way more, you know, pornography, which I think is actually like a huge like right. influence on the 
development because I mean, I think people talk about how there's like this spike in like the female rapid onset gender dysphoria in these young adolescent females, but I also think, you know, there's a corresponding rise in the incidence of the autogonophilic type because I think, you know, that typology is like more it's like it can be triggered by these environmental factors, you know, by exposure to like internet culture and like, mm -hmm. you know, TikTok. And so, so, so even though I think like the autogonophilic type has like an innate biological factor, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it's like due to hormone washes in the womb, I think so what Blanchard said um, mm -hmm. can be influential, but I still think that more and more people are kind of, getting like triggered by these environmental factors. It's, it's like a more conducive environment these days. Um, whereas like, I think previously it would have just kind of remained in the background. You would have just been able to like repress it. Mm -hmm. and, like Maybe that wouldn't have led to like a happy life. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the other, it's like, what's like the best way to deal with these feelings? Like it, like is transition, like the best way to deal with autogonophilia. Um, mm -hmm yeah yeah well the kind of the catholic approach that has been proposed uh which i i tend to agree with is what is what is going to be the most holistic way of dealing with it and what is the least invasive way of dealing with it right so if somebody has these feelings um well what do you let's go step by step down the road to where you are you're able to live with the feelings that you have right and, and some of this might start with therapy right is there ways to reintegrate or maybe there's not right so but if you're going to go down the road of action like the story of father nick like it could it be like putting on women's underwear right if does that satisfy that 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 those feelings right does that is that enough um right what the idea that well you have these feelings so that the only and best solution is full-on medical transition like that just seems to be such a jumping to the end <laughs> versus like there might be much more holistic things that can be done before going that extreme because there are consequences of it like that you can't there's no doubt that if you remove organs and you stop your hormones and you reverse your hormones and you do all this, that there's not going to be any negative medical side effects. Like that's, that's just not true, right? This is chaos on the body. If that's the only thing that's keeping you from killing yourself, right? Like that's the only thing then may, maybe that's, an, maybe that's the best option, right? Maybe, right. Uh, E. Christian Bruggers, who's a Catholic ethicist, makes the claim of that as well. And he's a pretty conservative guy. But it's like, if this is the only thing that will save your life, well, we still have to live in the truth. You are not a woman. You're still not a woman. Socially, you can be received as a woman. And maybe this should be the last and the last option, right? Last option. But it could be an option, right? Maybe it is an option for some people. But... We so, but, for everyone. Um, so, you know, living in the truth, you know, saying like, you know, I know, let, let's say you're a trans woman, you know, so, you know, you know, I'm not a, a woman, I'm like a man, I just like wish to uh -huh. live as if I were a woman. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people on like the, gen the gender critical side of things says that like that, that inevitably presents ethical issues insofar as, as if we're going to socially accommodate, you know, a mm -hmm. trans identified male socially living as a woman, mm -hmm. you know, there's this concern about policing and protecting the integrity of single sex spaces, right? Um, for the sake of, um, you know, women's, you know, health and safety and well being, and like. And I know you have like a couple chapters on um, the question of like women's spaces and ha mm -hmm. as it connects to like the transgenderism. But in, you know, in terms of like if, if we're going to socially accommodate, you know, like how how can we live in the truth mm -hmm. and then also deal with this question of like single sex 
female spaces and like what right. to do with um managing that and like gatekeeping that because you know because yeah there there's going to be you know if, if we're thinking about like the whole spectrum of like you know trans identified males mm -hmm. there's some of the autogonic Got, uh, of the autogynophilic ideology who mm -hmm. you know can be very passable and assimilate you know mm -hmm. as women but then there's others that it manifests in a very paraphilic fetishistic manifestation mm -hmm. that can be very like creepy so how do you you know <laughs> and like this and because it's so hard to figure out how to practically enforce you know like only allowing the non-creepy ones but like you know, don't allow <laughs> the creepy ones like you know, a lot of like gender critical feminists want to just say like, no, we should just have a principled stand and like not have any males in the female bathrooms or female spaces whatsoever, just as, you know, as, as a precautionary principle, just because, you know, the goal is to safeguard against like the edge cases rather than, you know, trying to practically figure out. So they're saying, you know, we're going to, just exclude everyone because we can't guarantee that these edge cases aren't going to present like a safety risk or something. So I'm curious, like yeah. what, what are your thoughts from like a legal, practical, you know, social perspective on like, you know, the question of like female spaces? Yeah. Yeah. The part, the truth part, I think as much as it might seem limiting in some ways it's, it, it leaves more room because like if you take the, Amnesty International or a million other organizations stance that trans women are women, then there's no reason why you could ever prohibit a trans woman from doing anything that a woman could do because trans women are right there in their essence, in their being, right? Is they are women versus if you say, well, you're not a woman, but you've had trauma, you've had a hard life, you had whatever it is that you've gone through, or maybe you maybe it is neurodevelopmental, right? You, whatever it ha has happened, you are not a woman, but we will do our best to accommodate you as a woman. I think that's, it is a better approach because you could say then, okay, we will try to accommodate you the best you can, but you are not a woman. Therefore, you can't uh, be an MMA fighter <laughs> against women, right? You can't be uh, a boxer, a woman's boxer. Um you don't have a right to female spaces. Maybe there could be gender hospitality, <laughs> right? Maybe there could be gender hospitality, but like uh, you don't have a right to it. It's not a right you have, right? Even at the beginning of the, the movement, the big push was to get a gender neutral bathroom available for people who you wouldn't feel comfortable in a male bathroom or in a woman's bathroom so let's create a safe space for you because we don't want people to get beat up in bathrooms and we want everyone to feel safe but it's amazing how quick we moved from let's have a gender neutral bathroom for our trans people to that's homophobic that's transphobic to have a separate bathroom for trans people trans women are women which means they have full rights to the woman's bathroom not the neutral bathroom right but again, that, that it kind of misses the nuance of the truth, right? Like we don't have separate bathrooms because of gender. We have separate bathrooms because of sex, right? It's the sex bo body parts, right? Same thing. Why do we have male and female athletic leagues? It's not because of one's gender. It's because of one's sex, right? So in some ways, it's very strange. <laughs> um, yeah. It does seem like, you know, the autogynophilic type seems to have a lot of like intrinsic difficulties with you know living in the truth i mean it's some it's in some ways you might imagine that living in the narrative that the the like constructed narrative autobiographical identity identity of like i am a woman mm -hmm. it's like part of the manifestation of the phenomenon itself insofar as one of the dimensions of autogonophilia is what Blanchard called, you know, behavioral um, mm -hmm. autogonophilia, where like the attraction is to being treated socially as a woman. Mm -hmm. So, it, so anything that goes against that, you know, just doesn't really fit into like, the self-concept because constructing that self-concept that you know desires like deeply needs 
validation of that concept, which is why like when they get misgendered, it can cause this sort of like uh, insult to the self, insult to the ego that triggers, you know, rage. We've seen you know, a lot of like uh, examples in social media going around of, you know, when people... Yeah, call yeah. me ma'am or I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> right, like yeah. That. It triggers like a, like a narcissistic uh, rage yeah. or, or like, a nar like a narcissistic um, insult. Um, well, so, it so yeah, it seems fantasy. like... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Right, it seems to like go against the fantasy, right? Part of it is more... Like I don't think androphilic or homosexual types, it's about any type of fantasy for them versus I think for some autogynophilics, at least how, as Blanchard describes it, it is more of the the fantasy of being perceived as a woman, right? So like even set notes in some of his writings that like, it's amazing how many autogynophilic people when they come out as transgender, like they try to date men because that's what a woman does but they're not attracted to men at all. Right? So it never really lasts. Like, it's like, I want to be fully perceived as a woman, which means to be, you know, dating men or having sex with men, but they're not actually interested in sex with men at all. Right. But it's kind of right. a fantasy. And also, on, <laughs> and also on, on the flip side, the types of men who are interested in dating the autogynophile type are often, are also just closeted autogynophiles themselves. <laughs> Really? Okay. Who are, who, are, who are using? Yes, they are what would be called like the auto gynoandromorphophilic type. So you have like a attraction to like you know the um, you know the sort of like quote unquote female body type as like a paraphilic interest, and then that becomes like auto sexualized such that you know that attraction to the transsexual body um, like like. Bec you you form like that same um uh, that auto sexual thing so such that you want to be that thing that you're attracted to so so like a lot of men who date um transsexual women like they they also have a sort of autogynophilic like desire to be transsexual women because mm -hmm. like that's you're attracted so so that's been borne out in like the research um which i find is fascinating <laughs> fascinating yeah, yeah. Um, um interesting yeah. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about uh, what is the t the Thomistic heuristic? Because you mm -hmm. kind of you know you spend most of your book you know kind of critiquing transgender I ideology, but then you put forward like what you call the Thomistic heuristic, and you say this is better than um, you know faith based conversion therapy. So I was wondering if you could like mm -hmm. talk about that because I think a lot of people might think of like the Catholic response to transgender ideology and they're going to think of like conversion therapy in the traditional mm -hmm. sense. So I was wondering if you could speak to like your thoughts on conversion therapy and like how that factors into um, the Thomistic heuristic. Yeah. Yeah. So Thomistic coming from Thomas Aquinas. So I kind of a Dominican minded person, which is for anybody who's not into Catholic theology, like Thomas Aquinas, 1200s, what Thomas Aquinas does in his writings on the Summa is he'll take an argument, he'll raise a question, and then he'll say, well, this person says this, and this group says that, and this group says that, and then I say this, right? And he kind of synthesizes ideas together in order to come up with his own answer, and then he responds to the opposition. So he steel mans his opposition. So he doesn't just like create straw mans, does the opposite, right? He steel mans his opposition. And you're trying to really synthesize this together. It's the same reason why my book is like 800 pages long, is that I'm not trying to give really my perspective. I'm really, what is the science saying? What is the legal expert saying? What's social, like, let's look at all the pers perspectives and try to synthesize um them into something that makes sense right what's the truth is really what i'm at right like so like every line i wrote i was writing a lot of this while i was in a monastery in northern scotland and i would think of the most conservative monk in the monastery and think is there any line that i'm writing that would really set him off <laughs> because I, i'm as like I, i'm not representing what i'm saying correctly right and so, and I would also think of my friends who are transgender. Is there anything that if they read it, 
they would be really mad at me for saying that, right? So I was trying to balance all the arguments and kind of, in some ways, not even give my own argument. Like, what is the synthesis of the arguments? But when we look at like the heuristic of like, what is the way in which we should respond to people who are transgender? Um, it's hard, but like conversion, th we would never do what we would call conversion therapy, because if your goal of dealing with this is repression, then it just comes out in worse ways. <laughs> repression cannot be the correct way of dealing with it. So it has to be some form of sublimation, right? How do you sublimate it into something um, productive or good? Also, what I argue is you need to kind of take a, an approach of the virtues. And I spend way, probably way too much time on the virtues. But I think it's important to, when you're dealing with these issues, to kind of get sections of your life in order, right? So, so if you go to a therapist back in the late uh, 2000s, right, 2015, 2018, um, You might be depressed, anxious, suicidal, dealing with all types of issues, anger issues, all types of issues. And then you come out as uh, gender dysphoric. The approach would be fix the gender dysphoria and everything else will figure itself out. It's probably all these other problems are because you're gender dysphoric. So the approach is to transition versus I kind of propose this idea of like figure out some of the other problems in your life, like start doing living more prudently with wisdom right more temperately in terms of sex which might involve pornography as well cutting back on the pornography right drinking drugs um living a courageous life one worth living right if live a life of justice right if we can focus on living those types of good life it might resolve some of the other issues and even if it doesn't completely solve it, it will make it better to move forward, right? It be, it, it's better to move forward from a place of virtue than from a point of chaos, right? It, it would be part of the argument. And a good argument for this, again, would be, and I even use the Mayo Clinic, Clinic advice this too to people with gender dysphoria, right? get outside of yourself, right? It's part of this is being trapped within your own ego and within your own mind. Part of this would be getting out of your own mind and out of your own ego, right? So like you wake up every day and uh, you go to church to start your day. Start off with prayer, right? Start off your day with prayer. And then you go and you volunteer at the food pantry at your parish, right? And you're working with a community of people and you're serving others. And you go for a walk and you, you, you serve other people just by getting, making yourself other focused will take the focus off of yourself. And if part of your dysphoria is that you are so unhappy with yourself, how you look and yourself, well, facing outward is a way of helping that because when you're staring at the mirror, you see all of your flaws all the time, but when you're serving other people, it redirects yourself, your mind and everything towards other issues. And um, part of this is where I also tied in Jean Vanier, who's a very controversial character now because he got involved in a, a sexual crisis right before he died. But he started these communities called LARC. Uh, they were for people with special needs, handicapped people, intellectual disabilities. But like this problem where you can't, accept who you are uh, is interesting because like if you look at somebody like who's in an, a LARC community who spent their entire life in a wheelchair paralyzed from the neck down who has can't even speak right slurs their speech uh is on so many medications just to survive if that person can accept their body how much more should we right like the fact that like none of us really fully accept our bodies, right? As I'm getting older and the beards get, you know, getting grayer and the wrinkles are getting more. And, uh, you know, my students think of me as their grandparents age. 
right? It's hard to look in the mirror, right? Imagine uh, a veteran, you know, 80 year old veteran looking in the mirror and they used to seeing this strong young man. And now they're seeing this old man who's falling apart, like feeling out of place within your own body and not at home in your own body is so natural to the human condition, right? But it doesn't mean that the body is wrong. It's just, it's hard, right? It's just hard in in our own embodied selves. Even if you take an Abercrombie model, and I'm dating myself with the reference, right? But if you take an Abercrombie model and you say, well, what's what are you insecure about? Oh, I got too much fat here. And I, I nobody is happy in their body, <laughs> right? It's kind of like a fundamental element of the human condition. How do you accept yourself anyway, right? And part of that now is love. Can you love yourself with your own imperfections? And love is a virtue. It has to be practiced. It's not something like I just feel it, right? No, it's it takes self-discipline to be in love with yourself and to love your body and to take care for yourself. It has to be a choice, right? So part of this as well is like, this heuristic is not conversion therapy. It's self-acceptance, right? It's self-acceptance. And it's also realizing uh, you're not alone. Like this is just normal, right? To some degree, yeah. it's normal. How, how would you respond or like, what, what would be like the Catholic response to the more like bodily autonomy arguments? So I know Andrea Long Chu, she just came out with like this, uh -huh. um, this like article recently giving this like argument for um sort of reconceptualizing gender medicine away from the sort of like identity model and more towards like the bodily autonomy model such that you know we just have a fundamental right to modify the sex traits of our bodies so you know in terms of living in the truth it might be like well i acknowledge that i have these parts I'm not in denial that I'm, you know, have the capacity to make small gametes, but I still mm -hmm. nevertheless like desire to change my body. And so mm -hmm. when we just, just all have a right to, you know, like if I want to, uh, you know, adorn myself in one way or another, if I want to express myself. Um, so what would be like the Catholic response to just like a more autonomy based answer, which is, um, I think it's harder to like, undermine just because it's just one of those principles where like you know you can't you can't really dig much deeper than i want to because i want to <laughs> yeah know? yeah yeah and and actually a lot of my book was responding against that type of uh whether i put it words or it's just in my own mind but a lot of it was against that type of behavior where i am just as john paul ii say raw datum i'm just flesh. That's all I am as a human being, right? It's the purely materialistic worldview where all I am is flesh, right? It's the existential idea, right? All I do is I exist. I have no essence. I'm just existence. And with my existence, I could create whatever I want. So if I want to cut my tongue in half and tattoo scales on my face and call myself a snake, well, who are you to tell me what to do? If I'm a snake, I'm a snake. Or um, if I call myself a wolf, I'm a wolf. And if I point my ears, I could be an alien elf from outer space. Uh, it's online. <laughs> if you ever want to see alien, right? The Therians, right? That I am an alien elf from outer space. And that's how I identify. And I'm going to modify my body to look like an alien elf from outer space. But a Catholic approach would be like, uh, no, there's a uh, teleology to your body. It exists in a particular manner for a reason it aims at a higher purpose uh we are also made in the image and likeness of god so if you try to turn yourself into a snake you are not you are abandoning your your image and likeness of god which is more than just the physical but like to say i will change my nature i will change my humanness my my humanity will be whatever i want it to be this is Luciferian in a sense, right? That I don't have a nature. I create myself. I don't have a purpose. 
I create my purpose, right? Well, this is exactly the Luciferian argument, right? This is this right. is this is the devil, right? This is not to uh, say the devil caused people to think this, but this right. is that argument. It does it does seem like the Luciferian framework or, or right. paradigm is like very much connected to like a transhumanist movement where you know sort of seeing technology as just like liberating principle and then connecting it to these sort of like third wave cybernetic approaches mm -hmm. to like you know um you know trans embodiment and stuff like this you saw mm -hmm. this in like the 90s i think with like um sandy stone some of her work responding to someone like the feminist about kind of kicking off like this trans feminist like movement where it's very much connected to like biohacking and transhumanism mm -hmm. and it's sort of like merging the human essence with like technology and sort of like really seeing like this sort of like experimental approach to the the human body and i i think that has become like the the, the predominant like um narrative where you sort of have your more your more old school traditional assimilationist transsexuals who like we just want to assimilate into the existing male female social dynamics whereas i think this mm -hmm. is more like third wave fourth wave you know you know post-human transhuman like perspective mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like no we want to sort of like move beyond the the, the natural distinctions and like we're, we're not we're not going to like be bound to any sort of like teleology which is just mm -hmm. contingent and not metaphysically necessary so like like I'm kind of curious, like, like how does the Catholic, um, you know, response handle that, like, transhumanist objective? Like, what yeah. is like the the objective grounding for the teleology, uh, other than just saying, like, you know, well, I think it's God. Well, what if you know you're not convinced that God exists, or yeah, you know, and we're just coming back down to like these big debates that are kind of intractable, or like, how do you get a handle on this? Yeah. Well, I saw Kate Bornstein. She made a TED Talk video about like, yeah, we can reinvent our bodies. Uh, Kate Bornstein is pretty radical, but like, uh, you know, maybe instead of like adding penises and breasts, like we could like add flowers. Like I'll have to have like flowers <laughs> instead. Like, why do they have to look like the binary sexual organs? You can make them to be whatever you want to be. Wouldn't that be great, right? And then like non-binary really would be a thing, right? Because you could be flower gender because you have flower organs or something, right? But the, the ultimate, like you can get into the theology of the body and you can get down into like Adam and Eve and Genesis and all this stuff, right? And even the incarnation of Christ who takes on human form, which deifies human nature, right? We could get into those arguments, but for an atheist, you're not going to buy it. But I still think it's a valid argument because the question is like, are people really happier doing all these things? Okay, you, you became a snake and you've added like flower gender body parts on. Like, are you really happy now? Like, is this, or is this like, if I do the next thing, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be the next thing. Then I'll be happy, right? It's like the people with plastic surgery. It's like, even in my book, I looked at the, like just regular plastic surgery, right? The amount of people who are getting boob jobs and, you know, tummy tucks and plastic surgery like is so high in America. Right. And you have even 16 year old kids going, asking their parents for like plastic surgery at 16 years old because they want to look like their Snapchat filter or some other version of themselves. Like this is all terrible. It's all connected yeah. though. Right. And it's not do, you, do you think anymore. that there can be like a happy adult transition to transsexual who's like well adjusted and like the transition like resolved their gender dysphoria and that it was like a good decision ultimately or or do you think to some extent that because i know I, i've seen some detransitioners take a kind of like a hardline approach and say that you know all transition is like ultimately like a coping mechanism to some degree or another or it's like it's it's like an escape from reality or like a trauma response and that you know they, so they they would say that like you know in, in the case of the so-called happy trans you know tr transsexual it's just like some sort of elaborate coping mechanism or some sort or another do you do you like go that far or, or, or do you acknowledge that you know in many cases like you know that th this can be like a good pathway that leads to like a well-adjusted um life 
Yeah, I think even if you were to say best case scenario, best case scenario, it's a coping mechanism, right? I think, and I don't think that's too harsh to say, like, if you really feel like I have to do this or I will kill myself, I am miserable every day of my life, I need to do this. Well, you can never actually become the opposite sex. Like you just can't. Like I could, I no matter how hard I try, I could never, I could never get pregnant. Right? <laughs> could never. Right? I, I could never do it. The best I can do would be socially transition because I can't biologically transition. Right? My every fiber of my being will be male for the rest of my life, no matter what I do. Every fiber of my being will be male. I might be able to socially transition. But that is a that is a coping mechanism, I think. Right. Interesting. It, yeah. Like I, the, the trans activists are not going to like that <laughs> because, like, they they there's this idea, and you and you see this with how you know gender dysphoria you know played out in the recent DSM, where you know originally it was gender identity disorder insofar mm -hmm. as just you know merely having like a cross sex identity that's different than your natal sex is mm -hmm. to somehow like disordered whereas now like merely having the identity on the trans activist view is not disordered it's just that that can incidentally develop dysphoria but then you transition medically you treat the dysphoria the dysphoria goes away and now you're no longer mentally ill you are just um part of the natural you know, gender variance in, in the, in the human population. And so there's this move, um, you know, to, uh, say that like, you know, transgenderism is not intrinsically disordered in some way or another. And this is something that like, you see like people like Julia Serrano have, you know, spent mm -hmm. her, her entire you know career arguing against this idea of like cis normativity, the idea that mm -hmm. like the, the, the cisgender life is somehow like, normatively preferable intrinsically in some way or mm -hmm. uh, or like another um so yeah I, I think the the these questions are are very very interesting um so I'm, I'm curious what you would say to that sort of like classic serrano um idea that like you know you're just projecting some sort of like bias against the like the, the the trans gender experience but you know once mm -hmm. you treat underlying gender dysphoria there's nothing like intrinsically wrong and so this isn't like a coping mechanism it's just like natural variation to some degree or another yeah yeah well here's where like i dissect the lgbt like to say why shouldn't men be attracted to men or women be attracted to women well you, you can't reproduce okay other than that, other than that, you can't reproduce. Why? Why would it be intrinsically wrong? Other than a religious argument, there's not a lot of argument there, right? You're just saying, allow me to be myself, and allow me to be attracted to who I'm attracted to, versus the transgender argument, which is like, no, I need to have like, half. I need to have a hundred thousand dollars worth of surgeries to be myself. Uh, I need to be on hormones for the rest of my life to be myself. I need to, like, you have to medically trans, you are united with the medical industry, <laughs> intrinsically united with the medical industry for the rest of your life for you to be yourself. And I think that's very different to say, I just let me be me is different than like, no, we need to do some like serious medical intervention for me to be me. Like, where else right. do you need that much in medical intervention? Right. Well, I think they're they're almost like thinking about normativity at the level of identity itself. They're like, well, you know, some people have the gender identity of like, you know, man, some have woman, some have non-binary, and like all those identities are equally valid. And and we all sort of just like have these identities, but then like our bodies may or may not align with that, but they they define normativity, they 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 define the normativity relative from the position of like the identity and then see if like the body is like in alignment with that um so it's a so to to, to that extent like you know to say that that like the trans identity is like wrong they would say like they just like 
they're for them like the subjectivity of the ident of the gender identity insofar as the gender identity is just like a subjective transcendental self perception of some kind like somehow like that transcendental self perception like it is like the foundation from which we define everything else whereas it seems like the more um, Thomist realist position you're arguing for kind of flips it the other way around where it's like, um, mm -hmm. would you say that's like accurate or? Um, yeah. We're back to that devil Descartes, you know, De Descartesian, right? It's we're down to the Cartesian problem. And I always, I find this interesting because I find that like trans transgender activists is far more religious than I'm even capable of. And I'm a pretty religious person, but they're far more <laughs> like the idea that I am actually like, uh, I have a human ghost that is like mismatching with my body is really a deeply spiritual. Like I am a, right. I have a female soul and a male body or a male. So like right. this whole soul and like separate installment is very strange to me. Like, from an Aristotelian Thomistic Catholic perspective, we are our bodies, right? I have a human nature essence within this particular body, which is connected. There is no me without my body. Um, but because of that, I am not black and I am not a woman and I'm not six feet tall. And I'm not like, there's just a lot of, and I'm not 20 years old anymore, right? Because right. I am me, I am enfleshed, I am, <laughs> right? I, yeah. I am a body. And the meanness is united with my body. If I were in a cat, it wouldn't be me, right? right? right. Like there's no me and a cat. Uh, there's just me and me, right? If I were in you, right? If I, I would no longer be me, I would be you, right? Because there's this idea of like, maybe it's reincarnation or something tied this in. Like there's this unique soulness of like who right. I am, which is completely disconnected from me. And right. And I could die. And then you can put that soul in a new body and that will still right. be you. Right. Like we don't have that perspective at all. Like I am only me. Right. right. Uh, it, 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 it is. It is interesting. You say that this new gender movement is like very deeply spiritual I've seen a lot of people comment on that spiritual dimension or religious dimension to this modern activist phenomenon. And like a lot of people have noted, and I've done several videos on my channel talking about, you know, an, an analysis of this new gender identity ideology from the perspective of like, like a new sort of cultist religious movement of some type or, or a, 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 like another. And I would be curious to hear from like a Catholic perspective, like how you think, this like rise of this transgender ideology is in some respect in some respect a response to the diminishment of the importance of religion in shaping mm -hmm. our worldviews to provide a sense of like foundational meaning and like purpose and sense of like belonging in our mm -hmm. like you know communities. Um, and you know, now it's particularly in like the individualistic West, we're all atomized, you know, we're very much, you know, consumeristic and there's you know, not a lot of, you know, deep meaning and like connection, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like heritage or, or communal worldview or like shared, you know, ancient practices to like ground mm -hmm. us. There's, there's not a lot of like, there's, there's very little sense of ritual these days. It, mm -hmm. it, it, in our society, we don't have like coming of age rituals for like children. Um, so I'm kind of curious, like how you see from the Catholic perspective, like this gender I, 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 I ideology serving like a, a function to sort of replace a role that more traditional organized religion served in, in the historical past to provide this like broader, you know, maps of meaning, I guess you mm -hmm. might call them. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, first, just 
point out to the first point that you made, uh, you know, some of this isn't new because it's just Gnosticism. Go back to ancient right. Gnosticism, right? That it's just, we are spirit, but we're trapped in these evil fleshy bodies. And the whole goal is to remove yourself from your evil fleshy body so that you can be your true self, which is spirit, right? That's essentially the gender is for these people, right? It's, right. Uh, I am my gender and I am trapped in this body. So change the body to match the gender because I'm really my spirit, right? Uh, so that's one. Uh, the second part is a harder one. To, it's easy to, to say it's hard to do. So here's an issue, right? You could say, well, if people replace their gender ideology with just being a good Christian or something like this, this would solve the problems, right? And I would love to make that argument, right? I would, you know, I could make that argument and be very popular among religious circles. There are religious people who suffer with gender dysphoria, right? There, there, are, there are people who have a worldview who do uh, who are transgender there's transgender people go to church right so i don't think it's as simple as if you just replace this ideology with another religious idea that will solve all your problems it won't it won't solve all the problems i do think it will solve the problems for many people particularly the teenagers right if you look at the huge amount of rapid onset gender dysphoria and the huge amount of the youth Right, uh, identifying and particularly as non-binary, right? If you think of most transgender people, if you look at it statistically, like most of them are non-binary, which and they don't medically transition. And by the time they're twenty-five, they'll just be married to probably straight right? or bi or gay or something, right? Um, but a lot of them, I do think that they're looking for identity, right? Like so, my generation, the generation before, a lot of them thought. I'm not going to raise my kids in a church because I want them to choose for themselves, right? I'm going to let them decide. I'll support whatever they decide, but I'm not going to give them a religious upbringing or a worldview. That's not a good idea. <laughs> I would say you need to have a worldview um, to approach things in life, right? Because life can life can be hard. So when life is hard, what is your reaction to a hard world right so for me from my catholic background my catholic upbringing even i'm looking at my office here at the pictures on my wall you know i have sister restituta on my wall over here who was a uh, a nun from prague franciscan sister who opposed the nazis and uh they killed her right and i have charles foucault who was also killed for uh uh opposing uh, I wasn't opposing anyone living among the Muslims in Algeria, and they killed them. Uh, I have Pierre Toussaint, who was um, a Haitian uh, uh, in America, who dealt with all types of problems in the 1800s as a black American. But I look at their lives, and and I have the cross right next to me, right? The cross next to me. The examples I have in my life of people who were faced with near impossible impossible circumstances in life and even died for it. But ultimately they won because they stayed true to their virtues, they stayed true to their faith and beliefs, right? These are the types of things that get me through day-to-day -day life, is being surrounded by images and ideas of people who have aspired to greatness and they died for greatness, right? And I think that that's something to wake you up in the morning. When students, young people haven't been exposed to anything other than, you know, how many likes I got on my social media and I want to be comfortable and I want to do what I want to do and I don't want anyone to tell me what to do and I need to create my own expression and I need to create myself. And so much of this is like how other people are reacting to me determines my value that's going to be, it's going to create stress. Like I know now, like if my job fired me here for something I said, I don't care. I'll just, I don't even care. I'm not, I have an audience of one God, <laughs> right? That's the only right. person I'm trying to please here. Um, and if the world kills me for it, so be it. Right. Not, uh, not actually that worried. I have good company. Um, so a lot I think of, the world, um, there's been a number of like, I think a popular, I think Catholic conservative figures in the media, people like Michael Knowles. Yeah. 
who have been really you know made famous and there's like this one sound clip that goes around a lot where i think he was speaking at like the cpac conference and he said something to the effect of like he wants to eradicate transgenderism from society and like you know mm-hmm. i think he also said you know that entails you know banning transition both for children and for adults so we're not mm-hmm. we're not and we're not going to like allow you know, transsexuals to, you know, use, you know, the facilities of their choosing, you know, it's kind of like, just kind of like eliminating any sort of cross-sex identification and, 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 and social transition in society. I'm kind of curious, like, what would you tell your fellow Catholics who are, you know, weighing in on this, you know, debate right now? Because there's a lot, you know, this trans topic is like very popular in you know conservative media or you know there's a lot of um you know religious and catholic figures who are think you know making these kind of very strong ide- ideological positions so i'm kind of curious like um where do you see like uh your other catholics or religious people talking about this issue like where are they going wrong and like where would you sort of like offer like a corrective from like your perspective yeah yeah it's hard because you don't want to criticize people but you got you know I did criticize a little bit of Ryan Anderson in how Hal- Harry became Sally. Uh, I know I don't want to, I just shouldn't say names, but there's other people who are very intellectual who are on this topic, who are out there. Just point to Notre Dame. You know, you can do your research who these people are, but like there's people who are out there and, you know, Matt Walsh can say something and they'll get clicks. Michael Knowles can say something, they'll get clicks. Like they are public personas. They say something and the crowds cheer. Like there is a whole nother section of the church who is much more sensitive than that. And we're not, we'll never be famous on YouTube because we're not looking like if even with my book, if I went hard on that trans community, it would have been done much better with conservative audiences, but by like being neither pro trans or or anti, right? Like trying to be in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. I was very, yeah, I was very (laughs) struck at how like balanced, you know, when I started like actually reading your book, I was surprised. I was like, wow, this is actually like pretty well balanced in terms of like, you're not, you're not striking like a hard line position one way or another. And I think it'd be surprising. Right. Um, Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was going to say, like, I think that that's like, might be surprising to people because I think people might think like, oh, like a Catholic theologian, it must be like, just have, you know, there's like very black and white. Here's the moral, you know, guidebook from the divine lawmaker. And it's just like, here, here's the rule. You know, here's how you have to act, you know, um, yeah, yeah. men act this way and women act this way and God made them separate. And that's just uh-huh. like easy peasy, you know, no complications. And, um, you know, just sort of like this divine, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like a manual that makes all the answers to how to structure society and gender relations, like starts so straightforward. But it, yeah. to me, it seemed like you had a much more uh, pragmatic um, realist, uh, approach, which I, which I thought was like kind of, um, yeah, surprising. I think from, you know, yeah, yeah. That, that, that surprised me. Um, well, here's why here's one reason. One reason is we don't know to what degree some people who identify as transgender might have an intersex brain. We don't know that there is some evidence to point maybe sometimes other evidence that says no, probably not. But in, in the face of science, sci- medical research, we don't know. So don't make an absolute statement when you don't know something, right? So in the cases that some people might be intersex, what is the appropriate response? The same way we deal with other intersex. It's a balancing act of trying to figure right. out what people should do when they're intersex, right? Right. I just interviewed a trans woman on my channel last night, actually, who had a hormonal issue. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 he has now sort of subsequently detransitioned or like is post-transition in a way. Um, but, you know, so, so natal male, but he had like a hormonal issue and like he never really masculinized during the pubertal process, and so you know his voice stayed high, and so he he often got, 
you know, he didn't pass as like a male very easily. And he get, often got, you know, treated female. Um, and so it just sort of became hard to live life as a male. And so like the question, so it's just the question of transition, but it's almost in the combination with like other factors with like, you know, his like mother's influence, but the fact that there was like a hormonal issue Mm -hmm. at the root cause of his failure to integrate into society successfully under the male identity, Harley had a physiological cause. Um, I mean, I think that's where some of these sort of like typological things, you know, mm -hmm. are like possibly incomplete is because, you know, in those cases, there, it does seem to be like, um, it's like a more straightforward physical cause. Um, mm -hmm. But but on the on the other hand, I am really cautious here just because there are so many trans activists of the autogynophilic type who often like to appropriate disorders of sexual development and and, and, and intersex conditions to sort of prop mm -hmm. up, you know, things like, you know, the sex binary is like socially constructed or that, you know, that there's more than two sexes, more than two genders mm -hmm. and stuff like this. So um, so while I'm like open-minded to the possibility of these, like kind of like, um, neurologically intersexed arguments for like trans identity, mm -hmm. like there's been, there's a, like a lot of evidence showing that, you know, trans people appropriate these conditions and say mm -hmm. they're intersex, even when they're, they're not, um, right. that's been well, well demonstrated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's the hard thing. Again, it's the idea of like when you say all trans people are trans for the same reason, it's kind of a stupid idea, right? Pe people might identify as trans for many different reasons. One of them might be <laughs> that there is an intersex, and that's just a question mark, right? We don't know for that. But right. you shouldn't close the door. The church should not close the door on something it does not know the answer to. The Bible does not have an answer to right. <laughs> to medical conditions, right? This is right. just, you take the medical conditions, then you apply the principles and say, what should we be doing as a result of the science and the ethics coming together? What should we do? Right. But we don't know. It, you know science developing. Yeah. Right? There's like a lot of people who sort of look at the trans phenomenon and say like, well, it presents so differently in all these different cases and there's no like essential trans essence such that you know uh -huh. it's like what you know in some cases it's like you know maybe it's like a homosexuality and it's like internalized mm -hmm. homosexual um and, and and like internalized ho homophobia in mm -hmm. this other case maybe it's like you know autogynophilia in another case it's like rapid onset of swear so there's no like there's no trans essence so 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 there's a lot of people i think on the gender critical side who are trying to make mm -hmm. this put or like there is no such thing as trans mm -hmm. uh, and they're trying to just like move away from the whole like language of trans and like there's this idea if we sort of like don't call it trans then like somehow we're going to better fight the sort of like nefarious you know mm -hmm. aspects of this, of this ideology so i'm curious like what your thoughts there in terms of like you know is that something you you could find like a valid argument in or yeah. Do you think there's some like, you know, shared essence that, you know, makes it such that when you say like trans, like that, that like means something like other than, cause right now I'm mean, asking like, well, like no one knows how to define what it even means to be trans. Like, are we all like talking smoke and mirrors here? Like what is transness? Like, um, yeah, it seems to be an umbrella term, right? It's just an umbrella term that encompasses many different things, right? There, there are people identify as trans who are just mentally ill people. Just like they're, that's their mental illness is that they've identify, you know, the, and they're mentally ill in every other possible way too, right? They're, they're mentally ill people. And those are the ones that are often the most dangerous to the trans community because you get this right. person who's just a sexual deviant who's like in the woman's locker room exposing themselves to young girls. It's like, right. he is trans in a sense, like under the umbrella, he is trans. Right. But, that is yeah. a particular thing. Right? Yeah. That's and there's also thing, right? um, certain forms of like obsessive compulsive disorder that can center around trans identification such that, you know, you, you have sort of these intrusive compulsive thoughts of like, am I trans? Am I trans? Am I mm -hmm. trans? Right. And that can, you know, sort of like, yeah, just be like a, 
like, like an external mental factor that's you know causative of these uh, developments rather than something more you know intrinsically gendered but then again it's like you know what's to say like what is like the true trans versus like mm -hmm. what's you know the fake trans because yeah. however you slice it and dice it, it often feels like you know it's like well it's the, these classification schemes in terms of this is you know real gender dysphoria and this is like mm -hmm. you know fake gender dysphoria or, or this mm -hmm. is like you know paraphilic gender dysphoria and this is like you know rapid onset and it's like it seems like you know these all are serving different pragmatic mm -hmm. functions or some degree or these different classification schemes you know are some are more useful than others and some you know are like not as useful um so yeah it seems like maybe we're getting back to that like nominalism of like just you know debating right. about descriptions of things rather than like the fundamental basis and like really we just need to get back to like you know we'll, yeah what is like you know the male and female the real mm -hmm. you know the, the real differences that like physically yeah, provably real um, yeah yeah well you can see like part of like why is trans like meaning everything for all people like some of this is the conservatives wanting to cast a, a wide net but it's, some of this is also like this evangelical gender identity, right? It's like gender activists taking this as a missionary effort to turn everyone trans. Like, and as much as that might sound like an over-exaggeration, like there was a bill in 2020 in California, like a trans health bill. And in it, it pointed out that like 27% of youth, 12 to 17, something like that, identified as transgender slash gender non-conforming and it's like well they're not the same thing transgender right. and gender non-conforming but why is this one of the statistics in a transgender health bill why is gen gender not conforming even a statistic in this bill other than to say a lot of people are trans therefore we really need to do more of like why are you trying to make trans bigger than it is? Like, if you look at right. the DSM, like it's like 0.02% of the population. And now you're trying to make right. it sound like this 26% of the population. I think the stronger argument is that it's 0.02%. Because if you say this is extremely right. rare, this should be an exception. Right. That's better than like everyone's trans. <laughs> That's yeah. not a well, argument. I mean, it kind of, I mean, if you, tr if you trace the history, you know, of like the trans umbrella, yeah, and it really goes back to people like Virginia Prince and the sort of like the transvestic, mm -hmm. you know, autogynophilic movement. And these were just like, you know, they were sort of the the, the transgender, transvestic autogynophiles who didn't want to go on to fully become transsexuals. Mm -hmm. And they developed this like movement um, to sort of like the, the like transgender versus the transsexual and like broadening it to include the gender nonconforming crossdressers. Um, into these like broader different categories of like these different types of like transsexuals. And then it just became this big thing. And then like, you know, I think in the nineties, it got connected to like the LGB movement um, you know, for purposes of like the non-discrimination activism mm -hmm. with like these different bills. So, yeah, I mean, it is sort of interesting politically, but I mean, it does seem like um, partly that expansion was due to the rise of like the activism from the sort mm. of like, auto gonna feel a cohort that sort of like you know pushed the transvestic um transsexuals into th this like broader category and then eventually it just all got supplanted by this like academic gender theory that came out of like the academia mm -hmm. um and, and yeah i don't know i think i think there's like a confluence of like historical factors here um so I know we are at two hours. Um, oh, yeah. This is, I don't, I don't want to uh, take up too much of your time. Well, so people don't want to... podcasts that are four hours long. I can assure you. <laughs> I, I... <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think like to wrap up here, I just kind of curious, like what would be your advice to, you know, like a Catholic parent who you know has like a child that just, you know, came out, you know, said like, Hey mom, Hey dad. You know i'm trans you know like what would be your advice to that parent um or not even like you know a teenager maybe it's like mm -hmm. someone in their early 20s because i think you know sometimes 
you know, we like cut off at like 18 for like mm-hmm. legal purposes mm-hmm. the, in terms of the, the, these debates. But like, you know, like young people, it's, you know, in college, you know, struggling with these things, like, you know, mm-hmm. so I guess what would we'll, we'll, we'll be your advice to like a Catholic parent if, if they're like, you know, young um, child came out? And... Yeah. Well, I, the first thing I would do would be to ask a lot of questions of what they think that means. Right. I think this is where even the therapists are falling short on this because it's seen as conversion therapy to even ask the question. Like, I feel like I'm a woman, a, a g- girl. Well, what does what does that mean to you? What does it mean to feel like a girl? Right. And what does it why? How how does that look like to you? What do you think this? Because I bet a lot of this is based off of stereotypes, like especially young women bec- want, you know, the, the big movement of teenage girls to to boys right why wouldn't you want to be a teenage girl well i wouldn't want to be a teenage girl right like you're dealing with your period you're developing breast all of your male classmates are addicted to porn and here you have female body parts uh the other girls are mean uh the boys are immature and they you know i could think of a hundred reasons why you why you would not want to be a teenage girl so if they're if the reasons they're giving is normal, I think it's useful to tell a kid, yeah, that's totally normal to feel that way. It's totally normal, right? Typical, even, right? Like we might not admit to it, but we to tell kids that they're normal, I think would actually make them, I think it would help because they're looking for an identity and they're like, I don't feel like I am a typical girl. Well, that is how every girl feels, that they are not a typical girl. So, like, it's good, I think, maybe to listen, listen, deep listening, like, what is the underlying issue, validate their feelings, and, you know, there's a good chance what they're feeling is normal, and letting them know it's normal, and then maybe try to get them involved. You know, things like Abigail Schreier, she points out, like, sports is really good for young people. It gets you physically active. It gets your blood flowing. It puts you on a team. It builds in friendships. Like people are just sitting in their houses by themselves on their phones and social media. It's not healthy for a teenager. You need to get that kid out into the world, taking some risks. Find what they're passionate about. Because if they're looking for an identity, and this is what they've latched on to, it's a really boring identity. Um become a doctor and go like save the world or something like that's an interesting identity of like, I think I'm a non-binary person because I don't feel like I fit male or female stereotypes. Like welcome to the human nature. Like none of us feel like we fit our stereotypes. Like (laughs) give them a bit, a bigger vision, right? Give them like, try to uncover what they're really passionate about and encourage them. And I think this might be a controversial, but I think a lot of parents, you go to restaurants the parents themselves at dinner are scrolling on their phone like and the kids are on their phone scrolling on their phone like kids are sometimes looking for attention they're looking for somebody to validate them and if every night the parents are not around not there the kids alone in their room that is not healthy Take the kid out for a walk. Spend time with the kid one-on-one. Like, dedicate energy to your kid so that the kid feels like you're there for them. There's a sense of community, a sense of purpose. You're listening to them. Because a lot of them are looking. They're looking for attention. You know, as soon as they come out as trans, they get all the attention, right? Tons of attention now. They were looking for the attention, right? And then when one kid comes out that way, then the other kids get neglected. So then the other kid is acting out in a different way because everyone's looking for for attention from their parents and the parents is, are too distracted themselves. Um, so I would say, again, maybe in a nutshell, listen, affirm what is normal, <laughs> uh, and then give energy and time. The kid is crying out for attention. Give the kid attention. But give the kid good attention. Don't be like, well, you must be wrong. there must be something wrong with you, so let's go medicalize you probably not the answer that would be that would be advice i don't know 
Yeah, well, that is a I think a great place to end it. Um, thank you, uh, Doctor Tabo. Um, where where can people find some of your your work? I know you have a book out. Do you want to plug that, or is 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 there any other you know forum that people you know can find you on, or are you publishing or doing anything? Um, I'm a very boring person. I have no followers. <laughs> I don't look for follow. I think you are one of my true followers on Twitter. Which when you follow me, I I said. Oh, look at that, a follower. Who's following me? And then uh, <laughs> I think this is Rachel Ann Williams. I think that's who this is, right? And so I reached out to you, but uh, it's because I don't have anything. Um, so uh, my book, Transgender Ideology and Gender Dysphoria, a Catholic Response, that's on Amazon and other places. Um, other than that, you can follow me on LinkedIn. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> Something yeah. like that. Okay, well, thank you for um, your time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. So um, with further ado, uh, take well, care. You. I'm going to turn off the stream and I'll see you on the other side.